Transportation Specialist, also known as an archaeologist, at the Iowa Department of Transportation. He has been in his position there for 18 years and has been working in archaeology for around 28 years. So he started when he was in sixth grade, just about. <laughs> Matt has also served as president of the Association of Iowa Archaeology and is a past board member for the Ames Historical Society. His undergraduate degrees are from the University of Northern Iowa and his graduate degrees are from Iowa State, where he is currently plodding away on his doctoral work. So the next time we see him, maybe next year, you can, we'll have to call him Dr. Dr. Donovan. Closer than next year, all right. As an archaeologist and historian, his interests are in the history of Iowa archaeology along with aviation archaeology. On July 25th, 7 p.m., right here, Matt will be back to talk about the crash of the B-17 bomber in Story County that occurred near Maxwell, and I think he's probably going to mention a little bit about that. Me, tonight. Okay, prehistoric Story County. Take it away, Matt. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll say a happy introduction, and, and again, my name is Matt Donovan. I am an archaeologist for the Iowa Department of Transportation. I've been doing that for about 18 years, a little bit plus now. Uh, I've been in archaeology since I was about 19, uh, and I was an archaeological assistant, which the phrase is shovel <laughs> Um I've worked across Iowa, a little bit in Minnesota and Missouri. Uh, my main focus work, though, has been here in Iowa. As a prehistoric archaeologist, I studied the Middle Woodland, which is the burial, built, the mound, mound built, excuse me, and burial mounds, and things of this sort. I'm an immigrant to your community. I come from the neighboring county of Boone, is where I grew up, <laughs> and I do most of my work for my master's thesis, which we're, gonna, of course, going to have to talk a little bit about this evening in Boone County. And as mentioned, actually, my specialty, and one of them is aviation archaeology, which my dissertation is about, and I'm studying the various uh, World War II crashes across Iowa, and there's more than you would imagine. Uh, we'll talk about that, of course, here in July, a little bit more about aviation archaeology, of course, the event of the B-17 crash by Maxwell. Uh, some people, someone asked me what RPA means. Uh, registered professional archaeologist, my joke is I, I filled out the form and sent them a check, and they sent me a certificate back. <laughs> uh, a little bit more complicated about that, but I, I feel like it really sums up some of how I got into this game. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world, Albert Einstein. Archaeology demands imagination. When we think of things, uh, here's a question. How many of you have found an arrowhead? How many of you would like to find an arrowhead? <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. When you pick up something like an arrowhead, you have imagination strikes. You begin to wonder who made it, how did it end up there, what was it used for, what is it made of. And this is part of the idea that we have in archaeology. Um, I've had to use my imagination several times. I picked up more rocks than I picked up artifacts. <laughs> I have. Uh, had to sort of come back that idea of being almost fictitional. What is the truth behind it? Um, someone once said, archaeologists are the cowboys of science. Uh, I take that as a compliment, but we imagine archaeologists as what? We think of Indiana Jones. We think of the mummy. I promise you that I have not tripped any mind booby traps in the last two or three years. I have not awakened the curse of any Egyptian princesses, though there are days that I do wonder that. Um, what's very important about that? If, if anyone out there, it's okay. I, I don't want the specific location, but where did you find the arrowhead? Skunk River. Skunk River? Anywhere else? Yeah. Kansas? When you picked that up, you thought about the landscape, didn't you? You thought about what you were looking at. Where am I at? Am I in a cornfield? Am I in a riverbank? This is part of the idea of what archaeology and one of the cores of it is. Uh, if I were to describe the landscape of Story County, what would it be? 
cornfields, grasslands, skunk river, of course, trees. That's around us. The city of Ames, the city of Nevada, Maxwell. These are all things that we come to the thought about when it comes to what archaeology is. Oh, here's, here's just a moment, though. You ever put a slide into a presentation and you're never quite sure why you put the slide in? <laughs> this is an example of it. However, what's here? Railroad stations. What's that? See the old road system? Why would the Iowa DOT need archaeologists? Thoughts? We're the biggest turners of Earth. And therefore, we do fun and do a lot of archaeology here in the state of Iowa. We fall within federal law, this is what we call Section 106. We also take in state accounts when it comes to both the preservation of archaeology, but also, very importantly, the preservation of burials. I joke about it, and I don't mean it facetious, but I say, it's a good day, I haven't dug up anybody. <laughs> And I also like to put the joke, and I'm sorry I don't be insensitive in the sense that poltergeists made my job easier. <laughs> and that has to do with the idea of protection. There we go. Um, when we think about this process of archaeology, where do you see archaeology happening? You think about it in the rural setting, right? Imagine that imagination. That captures it. If you find the arrowhead, for example, you find it out in the woods. What do you imagine? You imagine someone hunting. You imagine maybe back that there may be an encampment, a habitation site. You may think of a group of individuals going through. Someone asked me, How do you find arrowheads? I said, Well, hey, have you ever been pheasant hunting? And you clip out a shotgun shell and it lands behind you and you never see it again. In some ways, that's the same idea with arrowheads. They use, they break, you drop it, you move on to something new, you make a new one. I think this is kind of a cool picture. This is actually from the Historical Society's archives. Now that's probably a natural formation, right? Have you guys ever heard of a trail tree? This is probably not one. This is probably a natural occurrence. However, there are, within the vicinity, trees here in our central Iowa that have been saplings that have been what? Warped as a marker. It was a very controversial question for quite some time. But as you work with Native Americans, you start learning that this was tradition, something that did happen. We'll talk a little bit about that as we further in our lecture. And of course, what is the major feature of Story County? One of them, I should say. The Scott River. If you are in this period of time, you're using your imagination. If you have your, the one who made the arrowhead, what is very critical to your survival? Water. Water. I like to tell the story of uh, sort of understanding. If you remember the settlement of the West through Nebraska, what direction did the rivers go? West to east. As you come out here, our rivers go north to south. Start swinging around. These pioneers are going west. They're experiencing what? They're almost dying of thirst because they're not going in a direction that crosses a river. And as they become better, as they talk to the Native Americans in the area, they learn the rivers are going different. Well, that east to west, west to east. <laughs> this is our archaeological time point. Um, this is actually, I'll show you a link to a site at the end of the, where you can actually download this and take a look at it. We're going to be talking about the sea date from early Paleo-Indian, the Ice Age, following around to the early Archaic, Middle Archaic, Late Archaic, there's a couple, Early Woodland, Middle Woodland, Late Woodland, and the Oneota. And we're going to touch a little bit about the historic tribes in the area. So 
historic county in the Ice Age. Um, the Ice Age in Iowa, as we understand it, the Paleo period, is about 1100 to 500 BC to 850 500 BC. Oops. Um, the early Paleo and late Paleo India, something that we'll enjoy talking about, the Megaponda. Fluted points, big game honey, and the edge of the ice sheets. This is an extension of one of the ice sheets that comes out of the If you look closely, what surrounds it that they're pointing out? This is from the University of Northern Iowa's geology department. We're going to see fauna, we're going to see animals. But we see animals, fauna, that aren't seen today. Now, archaeology, the question of material culture. One of the important things to point out is how do we know the age of a site? We're looking for both a number of different variables, but we're also looking at points and arrowheads. Clovis sites, Folsom sites, these are the ones that are recorded across Iowa. There may be one here. This has recently been found in relationship to this. Does Story County have anything like this? It does. Now, the mammoth. Would you like to know my very first encounter of a, ma of a mammoth? <laughs> Do any of you know Mr. Snuffleupagus? <laughs> <laughs> well, think about this. Sesame Street, I think he might still be on. Mr. Snuffleupagus was an elephant, covered in hair. And so, the question that I had, of course, as a kid, to my father, God bless his soul, were there elephants that had fur? And he said, yes, they were called mammoths. Where do they live? Well, they don't live here anymore. Are there any more? The questions, by the way, kept going as this was going on. But the question, of course, was, what happened to the mammoths? There are various theories. But as we talk about the Paleo period, we're talking about, remember, our projectile point? These are fairly big. They're also fluted. Let me see what it is. I hope I can see them. Sorry, I should have put one on the slide, but right there's a fluid offer. The idea of how you hold on to it. How do you hunt a mammoth? They carefully is very correct. <laughs> Mammoths, by nature, probably didn't like us. Uh, they're big. They're probably not as mean or meaner than an African elephant. And it takes skills and organization. There's evidence, of course, of using the idea of spear, long spear, false spear, using a big, broad point. I will tell you this. These sites, I say sites, are very rare in Iowa. We have, these are probably more of this, oops, more than just our points. They're not much. Why is that? Over time, as you future archaeologists will understand, layers upon layers of what falls upon and moves around is soil. Most of these sites are extremely deep. They come out of one of the sites, for example, uh, some out here in western Iowa, are from sewer projects that went deep enough to come encounter that. Archaeologists look at those levels, and the further you go down, <coughs> the ideas about archaeology and soils, some soils would have some evidence because of how old they are, humans would have been around. Some soil is deep enough, humans would not be around. <laughs> Evidence of the Paleolithic in Story County. I mentioned, do we have any Ice Age sites here? Well, first of all, we'll talk a little bit quickly about proximity. There are Ice Age sites over in Boone County. There are Ice Age sites to the edge of Marshall County. Therefore, you would think that there were individuals that came across that were in this area. But we begin seeing proof. And that is a bone bed. In eastern Story County, there is an area that is very rich with paleofauna. 
And there is evidence, and a little bit of evidence, of interaction between humans and that fauna. Now, whether that was someone luckily took down an antelope, uh, did someone take down a caribou? But what we find is a number of these skeletons, and this is in sort of almost a ravine area. So we know some evidence of interaction. We also have bits and pieces that come up. Scrapers, blades, lithics. Remember the tool base. If your primary food is meat, your primary process is slaughter or butchery. The archaic period, something changed. The ice sheets were beginning the process of pulling back. Our period of time is 800, 8,500 to 800 BC. We see a change. We see a change in the landscape. Imagine, if you will, the idea of Story County going from that sort of semi permafrost forest tundra of those ice sheets falling back. Also keep in mind, they're melting, they're filling. If you head west to the one river valleys, you head to Ogden, you have a drop, right? Imagine during the area of the, of the Ice Age, towards the end, that river valley is full of water. Raging water pulling down. And that's why, actually, you have the one river valley Mammoths. You find the remains of mammoths. If you'd like to stop by the Boone County Historical Society, they'll show you the tusk from the River Valley. Do we have them here? Yes, we've had mammoth teeth that have been found in Story County. So, that's towards the end, of course, the Ice Age. But something has changed. The mammoths have died out. We have a change of game. We also have the beginning of cultivation. I put some of these archaic points because we're having a changing of that device. If I'm out battling the mammoth and have no fear for the mammoth, I would have been squashed right on the spot. You have this fear. You're trying to hook, right? You're trying to, usually with a group of people, you're trying to take it down. The mammoths die off. Environmental factors, over hunting, things were changing. Your game changes. So now you're hunting what? Smaller game. Deer, particularly. You also have the development of new tools. The axe comes in handy. The axe is used for grinding, crushing. It's also used as a weapon. This is not a peaceful time. Individuals oftentimes struggle to control over resources. And particularly one of the more interesting tools is the atlatl, the spear throw. Um, John Whitaker, who is an archaeologist at Grinnell College, is one of the great experts at atlatls. I would thoroughly embarrass myself trying to use one in front of you, but John can put one through a car. It's a spear thrower. And as we talk about, we have a change in both points. This is an example of the, the dark point. We also have weights of shells, the atlatl hook, and the process of pulling back, of throwing, of it releasing, and projecting forward. It's a particularly good weapon for deer hunting. It's a particular good weapon. We also have something very interesting that happens in the archaic. We have copper, copper points, copper blades. Question for you. This copper comes from Lake Superior. How does it come from Lake Superior to Iowa? Through trade, we began seeing trade routes are developing between various tribal groups, various prehistoric groups. And we see this being manufactured because you have a little bit more of something going on. You have agriculture, you have cultivation, you're having settlements. Uh, a good example of a good of an area that you will have in the archaic. Archaic sites also are hard to find in Iowa. Why are some of these sites that may not be so deep hard to find? What are these individuals wearing? Deer, 
skins and high heights, for example. Extremely well made, brilliant work. Wood, what grows crops in Iowa? Water, water, water. Along with good soil. Yeah, that is. Well, what happens with this, ladies and gentlemen, is that you have this material culture deteriorates. I have friends that are southwestern archaeologists, and they're amazing stuff they come across. I, 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 one of my background stories is that uh, an uncle of mine was involved with Mesa Verde National Park. And when I was younger and little, six or seven, eight or nine, I was taken into the park beyond the bases you travel to to be archaeologist. I was, a, I should call myself a Sherpa. I mean, I remember hauling a shovel. Okay, that was my great moment. But I, I like to talk about the idea that you have a dry climate, and therefore you can find woolen grooves, you can find baskets. But in Iowa, deterioration is so where we find bits and pieces of those kind of things. When it comes to archaic sites, we do have, there are a few of them. Uh, a couple of great archaeologists here in Iowa have done good work on this, and that link that I'll show you at the end will actually have links to their work to talk about if you have more interest in that. Now we get into the woodland period. And bear with me. I'm a little woodland archaeologist in some ways, so I will try not to consume this lecture of that. The Middle Woodland, 800 BC, 1250 AD. This is the early Middle Lake Woodland. Rise of agricultural practices, more permanent settlements. We also have what? Oops. Pottery. Go back for a second. Earthworks. We're going to call this, I, I'm going to, this probably isn't the correct phrase for it, but let's call it religious material culture. Pottery. Have you found any pottery? Anyone out there? I, I have a thing where I've actually stepped out of a truck and almost stepped on a piece. <coughs> up in Dubuque. Uh, I always joke with the Dubuque County engineer that he drew the short straw when it came to archaeology <coughs> and transportation because there's so much archaeology there. It would make sense because of the Mississippi. Pottery is a development of settlement in the sense that you have time to make it. And settlement recurs because of agriculture in many ways. Uh, I used to have a professor who's still around, kind of an interesting joker, but he always said the division of labor between men and women in this time was who did all the work? Women did all the work. And he'd always joke that if you were a a man, your job would be to, you know, of course, protect, you know, and go hunting. But most of the time, you'd be sitting by a tree and pondering something, you know, all this. But he would talk about the importance that you have, of course, of agriculture taking care of crops, but the development of pottery. And there's so many different types of pottery in the woodland. Uh, you have something over in Boone called the Van Heinen phrase. It's simply named after Thompson von Heiling, the guy I studied and worked for, worked in. You also have this, effigy pipes. What is the idea? How can you have time for that? If you think about this, this is something that you just do. There is an idea in the development of these religious items that you can follow. And if you look closely on a site, you can see the artisan. You can actually find a, a pipe that will be familiar to another pipe. Again, it takes imagination, but it's the idea of material culture that comes back. And of course, where it works. The barrier mound, the fortification, the platform. What does it take to make these? People, baskets, time. Um, Notes up here, but give us, I've taken this again from the Ohio Historical Society, who did a great work. Um, they talk a lot about the idea of what's this fortification. There is conflict. We talk about sort of the establishment again of agriculture, the idea of seasonal crops, 
We're also using other resources. Shells. Why do you find a lot of river shells in archaeology sites? Because you eat clams. You use the river as a resource. Fish words. Down by Tama. Excuse me, I'm sorry, by the Amanus. There is, when the water is low, you'll find a fish word that is designed to push the fish up to the people with the nets. Is the use of rocks? And of course, we have to talk about the subject of my master's thesis. Now, proximity. How do I know the whole Gwellian, excuse me, pardon me, jumped ahead, the Woodland period happened in Story County? I know by material evidence the finding of arrowheads. I know pottery has been found in the skunk. There are sites around this county that are related to the Woodland period. And of course, you have proximity to the Des Moines River Valley, which is a very big and long Hopewellian Middle Woodland archaeological site. This is the Boone Mound. This is by the Des Moines River Valley. It was once by the Kate Shelley High Bridge. Um, it was a very large Middle Woodland period mound. It was about one of the largest west of the Mississippi. It was discovered or recorded about 1904. But did any of you know who Albert Lee is? Albert Lee and Nathaniel Boone were traveling to Warner Valley. They were scouting in the Dragoon Carroll. What does Albert Lee mention? Large mound on River Valley. And we're pretty sure it was that one. Um, as you get into the mound, we see, of course, this, a substructure, rocks, limestone. The gentleman right there at the top of the older hat is Thompson von Heiden, one of the more interesting and interesting is a good word for him for a character in Iowa archaeology history. He went to Florida and founded the Florida State Historical Society, and along with getting in some ugly fights about archaeology. But if you look at this, oops, I'm sorry. This is the mound itself. You can see the excavation that went on through it. Dan Thompson, debris, way over there. It's called the Fruit Family Farm. The Fruit Family actually were leased and given money. You know, it's interesting about this, and again, it won't take us too far. This is one of the first corporately funded excavations in Iowa archaeology. Why? The trolley company. The trolley company took people out to visit the mounds. And they collected a fee, take a ticket, go out and look at the mound. So they paid to keep it open for the work to be conducted. It's also, if you can see the photographs as well, it's one of the first photographed archaeological excavations in Iowa. Again, this is next door in Google. This is the interior of the mound. You can see the vaults. What was inside of the mound? People. The interesting element of this is we talk about trade goods. There are a few trade goods that are found in the interior of the mound. However, the mound is covered in shell, one layer, ash, Shell, ash, dirt. Oh, by the way, why wasn't this mound originally dug up? Because somebody, a European, was buried on top of it. A trader named Oliver Cocker. It was fine to dig up the Native Americans with prehistoric people inside, but to open up a copper grave, you had to go through the state and find the copper descendants. Skeletons inside. Trade is not just stuff. Trade is also culture. Their foreheads were flattened. Anyone think of nowhere you've seen that before? South America? Mine? Where are these mines? But the influence of religious culture, that trade of culture, 
had made its way up. This is also very familiar. I said Hope Wellian. Hope, Ohio. This is where you find the most of, of course, the middle woodland, these mound builders. Also, of course, there was something called, again, bear with me, I'll be quick, the mound builder myth, which they were built by someone else besides the descendants, excuse me, the ancestors of the Native Americans. No, that's not true. You also have the skeletons covered in red oak, red clay. And what you find out, what is that ash, those layers of ash? People. You burn a charnel house, you put the ash on top of the mound. Was the mound built in a day? No. The mound was probably built over time, which is part of the middle woodland. The idea of you have a group activity to be one you do. The crops are out. We have a festival. We work on the mound. We build up a religious area. We also have a sense of hierarchy. Because these individuals that were buried in there, which have been repatriated in the Native American cemetery, were more than likely some level of chiefdom. We begin seeing that. I have to let you something right off. Onya is misspelled. Thank you very much. I know my. So some of my old professors would not speak to me for this, but O N E O T A, Oneota period. The Oneota period is interesting to me because it is a transition. I have a question for you. If you have large settlements like, let's say, the Buddha Mound, it's actually the village site is called the Gracie Paulson Village. Gracie Paulson was the granddaughter, excuse me, was the youngest daughter of the Fruit family. And she was the one son, and she owned the property when the ruin had passed away, and so the village site was named after her. You have these concepts of words, 1245 or AD, to, what is this important? French, the arrival of the French explorers <coughs> into the area changes things. We have large villages and territory. But we know these villages interact. We know that subsistence economy has come back. Something has gone on. We do have agriculture, correct? We have plant collecting. We also have fishing and hunting. But we have a great deal of interaction amongst villages. We also have conflicts between villages over resources. My question to you, and I can't really answer this very well, what happened in the middle woodland Lake Woodland, where these large settlements disperse. Any thoughts? There is the thought about climate change. We had entered different eras. Crops had failed. Maybe internal warfare. Maybe the whole bullying were driven away or driven out. There wasn't warfare at the time. Something occurred. And we just see a gradual decrease or deterioration. And then we see society, what would you say, culture changing, finding the use of smaller arrowheads as we look at this. What if I said that? Arrowheads. In the late woodland period, the bone arrow arrives. We also see the use of it throughout, of course, until the arrival of, of firearms. Uh, the development of the bow is critical. The process of hunting what? Deer. What else is becoming predominant? Buffalo. Small game. I always like to talk about in Iowa, we name things after like what was once was. Elk Springs. We have plenty of elk in Iowa. We also had buffalo. Lots of buffalo, honestly. Different variety of buffalo. Occasionally you'll see something out of the South Skunk. It'll show up, it'll be a buffalo head, a bison skull. Some of them date back. There's a few that have been found that are paleo in their origin. If I think if you actually think of a Dr. Matt Hill, Iowa State University, Matt actually examined the remains, I think, of a prehistoric elk. Matt would probably chew me on this. Um, that was actually very rare that popped up. You don't find them. 
the Oneonta village becomes more mobile. But why is that? I talked to you guys about proximity. I have a question for you about proximity. You may or may not. We'll see. In Story County, were there ever grizzly bears? Here's our proximity. They were in Nebraska. We knew that. Lewis and Clark talked about, I'm not getting out of the boat because of them. And they're very, they had some sort of really awful type of grizzly bear. It hunted people. Native Americans said, don't go near there because they hunt you. They smell you, and what do they do? They come to eat you. They like the taste of humans. Stay away. And I would be back <coughs> in In Illinois, I know they're bears. I know they're grizzly bears. Because what do we find? Something in that structure. We find claws. And they're not careful. They're claws, but what are they attached to? The bear. <laughs> because if I were finding claws in, in Illinois, what would I say? They could be trade goods. I'll give you this batch of, of bear claws for that kind of idea. In Iowa, we don't know. But someday, some brilliant young archaeologist or brilliant young archivist will find evidence of, I'm sure, grizzly bears here. We do have bears in Iowa, as you know. I have a question to step back about human thought. And it's kind of a little bit of sadness, but we need to think about this with burial goods. In the Oneonia period, as we also talked about Mississippian society, you find Kyokia, you heard of this horse in Missouri by St. Louis, the grass mass earthworks. We begin seeing grave goods. What do grave goods mean? You're giving something to someone to take with them. Something caught my eye once in reading about uh, some Midwestern archaeology, the grave of a child. And in the child's grave were, of course, grave goods. But there were also the wings of migratory birds, of geese. In burial, a Neolithic burial in Europe, in the grave of a child, or the wings of a migratory bird. Human perception of a generalization. Why wings of birds? Migratory birds come back every year. The hope is that you will come back to me one day. The general idea of great goods. We begin to see these, of course, both in the end of the Wake Woodland I, again, mentioned the Boone Mound. The Boone Mound has a lot of weird uniqueness to it. It's one example. We have other grave goods that come out. We don't dig up graves anymore. We don't dig up mounds. That's just what we don't do. The information, for example, of 1907 and 1908 is critical for our understanding. Well, we have a number of laws to protect our burial mounds <coughs> and protect these burial areas. We talk about, we just mentioned the Oneota period. Things happen. We have tribes moving around. Consistently the idea of territory. But we have pressure that's happening. Historic tribes. We see the movement because of what's happening to the east. We also see things happening. Who do you know? You of course refer to the Soto. The Soto is the conquistador, explodes the south. In the Mississippian era, which is happening at the same time the Ona, the Oneota, is an age of kingdom. There are great chieftains. Shikokia is one of these great chieftains. You have a central power, they organize things. Their job is organization. They're a wonderful, beautiful bureaucrat like myself. Okay? <laughs> Their idea is to do the business. Chieftains were religious. The Soto comes and he visits these sites, these big vast. Full of people. Goes down the road, a few months later comes back. The villages are deserted. What's happened? Diseases arrived. 
And this is what decimates Native American populations, particularly in this period of time. We see disease moving rapidly through. Doesn't occur in Iowa. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we have the arrival of French explorers. Uh, French uh, Juliet, authorization, the colonization that comes into Dubuque. We have the idea of putting in waters. Julian Dubuque. Julian, of course, arrives. What his primary purpose is, Julian likes to make money. Uh, lead mining. Why does he want to lead mine? What is a new thing on that? <coughs> right. Guns. From 1676, we start moving in, of course, into the 1700s. We have a communal pressure of historic tribes. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Some of our tribes that we find here in Story County of the Ho-Chunk, uh, the Ocher on the Winnebago, the Iowa, Sante Sante Sioux, and of course the Sac and Fox, which are Meskwaki. Um, do we, of course, have evidence of this in Story County? Yes, of individuals, of tribal groups. We have contact, we have trading, things of the spoke of European amongst tribal elements. Um, what is our what is our evidence of that? Proximity. There are two archaeological sites. You can go see one of the most significant features of it still in a museum. And this is in the neighboring of Boone County. Let me tell you kind of a sad story. In the early 1940s, does anyone know what the WPA is? Okay. The WPA, as well as building roads, did archaeology. It was actually one of the tasks that were assigned to them by the federal government that archaeologists would use workers to excavate various sites for the increase of scientific knowledge, along with the protection of sites. They actually did some work for that. The WPA were working in Boone County. They were working in correlation with the county court, excuse me, the county engineer's office. As they were working on some bends in the road, they had grades. They didn't hit a cemetery, but they were hitting graves. 17. The graves had been buried shallow. And they were Native American. They knew this because of goods that were found in them. Um, a bracelet was found in a school. There was a display case, once in a school, an elementary school, that had various things that were found in the county. Everything from a musket ball cup. But there was a piece of jewelry. And it said, found in the grave of an Indian child. In the location. The problem about that is that's pretty much what we know. We know a newspaper article simply talking to the WPAs here today to work on the Native American the Indian burials that were recently found. Burials are re interred close by. The feature that they talk about, there are eight different features in the county named that. We know why were they buried shallow. There's no signs of violence for them disease. Something in hit hard. It was probably in the winter. So they were hastily buried. And that's all we know. The other item to look at, now bear with me, remember this, you need to go to the city of Madrid to their historical society. And it's my understanding, I think it's still on display, is rock. <coughs> this rock, it comes from Pilot Mound, Iowa. Now, there are legends of Pilot Mountain that when we have a period of historic tribes, and I want to say this right offhand, historic tribes are living tribes. So their history is alive. And that's why we're, we're not going to go too further into this. But by Pilot Mound, it was considered part of the neutral zone between the Sac and Fox and Sioux. 
uh, had been established by our federal government, whatever, things of that sort. But there accordingly was a great battle between the tribes. That's legend. I couldn't tell you what that's at. I've actually kind of looked for it. I, I've done some archive. I'll go find it and mark it and move on. But somewhere it's out there. The feature, though, of the rock comes from the period of time of Native American removal from this area. And the rock says, no go, no go. And accordingly, that was left behind by a group of Native Americans that wanted to stay in that area and actually hidden out or hid away before they were captured by soldiers and taken off to a reservation. So with that, we do know, when we talk about the Oyota, we talk about this early sort of transitional period, like prehistoric, we know historic elements of his tribes, which in itself, honestly, does need to be another lecture. And uh, we'll be quite a good speaker for that. Um, I talked about links because part of what I do is, let's call me a public archaeologist. I can call it the various names, but public archaeologist for it. But these are some links I think are excellent to take a look at. Um, Archaeology.interview of Iowa. This is the state archaeologist here in Iowa. Uh, brilliant work, connections to that timeline, but also will give you a much better description of the time periods. We'll talk about archaeological sites across Iowa. This is something I promote, of course, the Iowa DOT Gov. All A cultural, we'll be sure to get these two if we need to. Historic publications. The DOT does archaeology. What if the DOT can't avoid impacting a site? What do we do? We document it, we mitigate it, we excavate it. We have some of our booklets that we produce with correlation with the Iowa. State Historic Preservation Society, along with tribal groups and things of the sort, talking about the history of both structures. We also talk about lots of bridges, for those of you who like historic bridges. And we also talk about the archaeology of them. I also like to kind of present a couple of books that you might be interested in. Uh, each one of these individuals owes me a beer for uh, promoting their work, but that's okay. Lynn Alex is actually an old mentor of mine. She's a brilliant public archaeologist. This is Iowa's archaeological past. I think this is available here at the public library, also on Amazon, eBay, places like that. It's a very good broad overview of looking at Iowa's archaeology. It talks about some of the significant sites the Boone Mountains mentioned in it, along with some of these other sites I've talked about, the paleo sites or the various sewer operations, sewer building. This just came out, Bill Whitaker, another friend of mine, Lynn, and and Mary, I'm kind of a little bit a part of this. Uh, this is actually a really good tour guide of talking about the locations in a broad sense of Iowa archaeology. Where do you find a site like this? Where do you find this sort of point? This is from Lance Foster. I, Lance is a friend of mine, a good friend of mine. He is a uh, TIPO, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Iowa. Uh, Lance has written a book about the Indians of Iowa. It's very good. Uh, Lance is a, a great speaker and can talk a great deal about tribal history, but also talks about the importance of landscaping. Even more than we talk about it now. He'll talk about those ideas of what it means, what do you see, what does Native American see. This is by one of my mentors, Joseph Tiffany. Uh, Dr. Tiffany was here at Iowa State before he went to Wisconsin to teach. This is a Project Points of Iowa. This is actually, you pull it out. It's like a little poster map. Laminated, it has all the different points you find here in the state and also talks about the material they're made of. Uh, if you are a collector or a point hunter, there's an example of our closest point, some of these big points in the paleo, one of our little bit points for arrowheads. I also like to talk about Toby Morrill. Toby is about ready to retire. Uh, Toby is an expert in Iowa projectile points. And there's a mystery. Uh, Toby has a great story. I have to tell you guys this one. Toby was doing some archaeology work at a point over in Polk County. He's digging away, and all of a sudden, he comes across some bones. And they're five bones. And, and to Toby's spot on. He, he knows what he's looking at. He says, 
just don't know what that is. And he takes it back to the lab and does an analysis and goes, no one's going to believe me. They're reindeer. <laughs> and, and Toby's like, I mean, okay, caribou, you know, things of the sort. These are reindeer. And Toby said, so I got up. And he works over at Anamosa. Went, I think Toby said, yeah, I walked downtown, I walked back. That night, I went to my, my, my watering hole. I pondered. I came back the next day. The reindeer. <laughs> and then it occurred to him. Santa's Village. <laughs> there had been an amusement park nearby that had a Santa's Village. And part of the area where they kept the reindeer was where he was looking at. <laughs> Another quick story about archaeology, and I'll share this and we'll move forward, but um, Iowa State University's archaeology program, of course, with David Gradwall, which many of you know, uh, before David was Professor Beckenridge. And Dr. Beckenridge, <coughs> Professor Beckenridge was a metallurgist. At first, that was his primary life. But he also did archaeology, an avocational archaeology. And he, for example, always joke is like, Professor Beckridge gave all his screens and shovels that formed that group, you know, when he retired. Professor Beckridge had a lady come in from a farm up in northeastern Iowa, and she had an axe. And what did it look like? She said, it's a Viking axe. And Professor Beckridge was like, and, but yeah, what do you have to say when you see this? I don't know. Let's take a look. And so Professor Becker is a metallurgist, so he's taking a look at this. You know, he's taking a look at his uh, bits and pieces of metal. He's just, I can't make an analysis. I'm going to date yet. And he's just curious. He's holding it like this. Here comes a buddy of his who walks past from North Carolina. Tobacco cutter. <laughs> he's like, what? And he said, no, it's tobacco cutter. He goes, what? Well, my dad had one. They used to have this company that sold these tobacco cutters that replicated things like the Viking Axe. Or, uh, so, uh, that's just an example of how that when we do archaeology work, it takes time. There is always the impossible, but there's more likely the probable. And that's just method as it puts it. One of the things we just touched upon, of course, we talked about the prehistory and the archaeology of, of story counting in the sense of up to a time period. Let's call that about, when was the county formed? Anyone? 1840s, 1850s? Remember my lecture on John Valera a long time ago? And uh, actually, uh, 1860s, we have the foundation of farming of Ames. So we have historic archaeology. And we'll, you know, maybe I'll get another lecture and we'll talk about. And we'll talk a little bit more about cabins and talk about barns and we'll talk about things underneath the roads of Story County. Recently, what was found when they tore up one of the roads by the credit union? Dinky tracks. It's easier to leave tracks in place than to take them out at times. Uh, I have friends of mine that specialize in bricks. You may have historic bricks in your patio. I have a bunch from Boone, from the Boone uh, Brickworks. Uh, actually, I know the family that owns it. And they asked me to get the bricks, and I said, hold on to them and sell them. And that's exactly what they did. So a lot of restorers love them. Um, I'm trying to think of what else to talk about with historic archaeology. There's so much. I like the joke, it's the bane of my existence some days. And what I do from DOT, and that's not, not being cruel. I, I deal with farmsteads a lot. I deal with a lot of the construction of cabins and things of the sort. And we do our best, of course, to gather up that information. The challenge of historic archaeology, a nameless county had a, had a very a lost city. Small town, they're really abandoned towns. Uh, I'm sure Story County has some. These towns no longer exist. And all you would find is the archaeological record. Uh, the county was doing road work. The county engineer faced the issue of explaining to his board of supervisors why it was important to do some archaeology for historic archaeology. And one of the county supervisors, a very pleasant fellow, looked at them and said, why do I need to go look at this when I can go look at it in an antique shop? 
It is. It's a challenge. How do you argue that? Um, had it been prehistoric archaeology, they would have been fine with that, they said. But, um, yeah, uh, just to give you a preview, <laughs> next month, if you choose to, you know, come back, we will be talking about the crash of B-17 here in Story County in 1944. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an aviation archaeologist to some degree, and we'll be talking a little bit about the events that occurred. We'll talk about the historic documentation, the newspapers. We're going to talk about the mystery, too. This is a time before black boxes. So we'll talk about how the United States Army Air Corps investigated this, what their conclusions were. We'll talk about the casualties. Everyone was killed on board. This aircraft was on its way to England. It was flying in Akron, Nebraska. It was flying on a fairly clear night until it ran into a snowstorm, the rest of it squattered. And something happened at 15,000 feet. And we'll talk about what 71, 72, 73 years later you would be able to find. There's not much. Uh, I like to talk just a little bit about aviation archaeology out west of flying planes. In Iowa, you find bits of metal because we have a scrap drive and accessibility. The plane out in the mountains is going to stay there. The corn field will pull out. So, anyway, um, for the most part, that is our lecture about archaeology, except for one final thing. Um, I think a lot about archaeology in the sense of material culture. And I think a lot about how an old archaeologist, grumpier than me, was walking along one day. He told me this. He says, archaeologists are always looking down. It's part of our nature. But you've got to look up every once in a while. Not so you don't walk into the tree or off the ledge into the river, came close one day, and or walk into the bear. Um, but it also has to do with capturing time. Um, in each one of your pockets, your purses, or your car, you have change, you have pennies, you have quarters. And there is a piece of one of those quarters or pennies that you can remember that you have. Uh, I have a penny that, of course, I left on my desk from uh, 1993. And I was an undergraduate. I just completed my work in Northern Iowa. I was young and beautiful and all that kind of things. But I can remember that. It captures my living memory. Step back and think about your arrowhead and the imagination that you bring to that. It's not your living memory. It's about the imagination of that individual that made that. It's about what they faced to survive, what they thought, what they imagined. And you catch that idea that hopefully it's sort of the vision of it. And our only hope that I always feel like in our material culture is somewhere in the far future, whether it's 30 years from now, 300, 3,000, someone will pick up a penny, a quarter, a dime that says 1993, and they'll wonder what people thought about and what they were doing and what their memories were. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our lecture. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
we do have discoveries. We have uh, construction workers that let us know. Uh, sometimes I, I'm somewhat of a master of getting the uh, interesting phone call, uh, which is good. It's part of what I do. I have everything from you know individuals having concerns about how to take care of barrel mounds on their property. Uh, I've had individuals talk about discovery of some very what they think is unique artifact. Um, I had a lady call me about fairy rings. What are fairy rings? There are grass circles, often caused by a biological element, and the lady is very pleasant but has some interesting theories on how they derived. Um, imagination is important. Um, I had a very, very pleasant lady, who I will not speak ill of, uh, who called me, and she was very interested at Iowa State University back to Professor Beckenridge because she had heard about metallurgy. And we discussed what metallurgy was. And she said, well, I have some really interesting finds in South Dakota. And, okay. Um, and I was just, you know, we just talk. You know, it's my important, my role. And it did turn into a conversation about the Vikings in South Dakota. Uh, it had to do with something called anchor stones. And we talked about probability. And yet we made sure that she got her contact to Iowa State, and they were very pleasant to her about what was going on. But people have ideas and theories, and that's fine. Theories are important. Uh, I have to come back to the probable. Uh, so we do have individuals that contact us. Uh, we've had late discoveries. Uh, we do a very good job about <coughs> issues with barrels. Let me knock on something when I do say that. Uh, but things do happen. And we have a protocol. Uh, if you have, for example, an issue with barrels on your property, something turns up, you discover something, or the state archaeologist's office. I've always worked with them contacting law enforcement. Uh, I've actually had, I'm not going to say the pleasure, but I've worked with law enforcement before and been sent to go look at something to see what that's about. Um, we don't have a, a lot of individuals that, you know, are very interested in what our work is, um, particularly um, that common history. Uh, a lot of people will enjoy talking about their farm sets. When we go out in the field, I'm probably knocking in your door to ask you about your property. Uh, preferably not getting shot at, but um, <laughs> it hasn't happened, but again, let me knock on that. But yeah, that's pretty much how we approach it. We do try to go out in the field and we do try to get a lot of data, a lot of information before we go out and dig. It's, it's, we're, for, we're very far on that scouting process, so. Yes, sir. I remember a while back, a year or so ago, they found a mammoth down in southern Iowa. So mm -hmm. we're, are you familiar with that? Yeah, actually, I've been to that site. Uh, that was on a private property that it came up. It was a mastodon, a Columbian mammoth. Um, interesting process. Uh, I will let you know that not too far from here, in the Boone River area, up in Webster County and Hamilton County, there was another mammoth find. Um, they do come up a lot. Uh, I, uh, there's actually Grinnell College at one point has something called the Grinnell Mammoth. It's a mystery on whatever happened to it, but it was actually excavated in a corner area of their state bank that was being built. Uh, interesting tale of, of this entry. Uh, here's something to know about mammoths in Iowa. We do not have any sites that have human interaction. We know that probably happened. What we have not had now for means to come up that showed cutting or any type of impact from human activity. Um, that's just kind of, it's yet to be found. Yes, sir, come back. Somewhere in like northwestern Somerset here in Ames, I was told and shown that there is a burial mound and it has a black thing fence around it. It was said to be an Indian. Do you know anything about that, and how did they know there was an Indian barrel mount as opposed to any other racial thing? How to talk about that sensitively? Um, <laughs> do I know of this? Yeah. Perhaps. Um, <laughs> but how do we determine if we know a barrel mount? Uh, oftentimes, when we take a look at soils, um, there are things that are geological features. We had glaciers, things moved around or pushed around, right? Uh, but what we can talk about the development of a, of a barrel mound is oftentimes first is how our setting is. If it's in the middle of nowhere, pops up, 
suspicious. We look at that soil profile. There's a couple of techniques that are done that are non-intrusive. Um, we would ask the question, of course, were there other sites around the area? Was there a relationship to that mound? There probably is. It was a, what I know of this, if I knew anything, it was, it was a controversial issue, of course, in development. Yeah. And the right thing was done. It's not right to take people out. I just, that's where it is, that's where I stand. Um, we can take different procedures to avoid, that's what we do. It happens, it does happen, but we make it right. And we take that in mind. I work a great deal with tribal groups around Iowa and tribal groups that are interested in Iowa and we work very diligently with them. Uh, I send, of course, we send uh, current communications about what the work we're doing uh, along with our reports. So we, we, that's one of our, our, what we try to strive at. And I'm lucky to belong to the Iowa DOT in the sense that we are one of the best in the nation for it. You know, it's something for the citizens of Iowa to be proud of. We actually have a great love of our history, but also our prehistory. Uh, things do happen, and we do work towards making those events, we correct those events. Uh, there are a lot of tough stories from the past when it comes to archaeology and human remains. Uh, a gentleman told me one day that he used to work for a, a trucking, well, excuse me, a, a car dealership in Boone back whenever, and um, there was a truck that came in, a uh, dump truck, in the back was full of human bones. And they came out of gravel pit operation, which had impacted a set of burials along the wonder about it. This, however, was in the 1940s. In the 1930s. The remains were reinterred, as I understand it, in a cemetery. Uh, either, I believe, a, a Catholic priest or a Cornish of a Lutheran minister had them reinterred. Um, it was happening. Uh, I have a couple of mountain groups in the Demarder Valley that disappeared by construction. But this is back in a longer period. This is back in the 40s, the 50, 30s. Uh, the excavation of the Boone Mound. It was 1907, 1908. It wouldn't happen today. So, that's kind of what we do when it comes to dealing with human remains and the protection of them in burial mounds across the state. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you tell us something about the scientific instruments or tools that you use in your analysis? You know. Archaeologist Emeritus now, uh, but 
Uh, Brennan was strategic in putting that together, working with Native American tribes and developing and talking about archaeologists and archaeology in the future. It's very good showing people in action. Um, those are some of the ideas and tools we use for analysis. We use chemistry. We use the idea of carbon dating, uh, which Iowa State is actually one of our, you know, we do at Iowa State, of course, the University <coughs> of Iowa. Um, to sort of talk about what my unit does in the DOT, there are four of us. Uh, I guess I'm the senior person, but in no way in charge. Uh, we have a staff archaeologist, Brendan Dolan. We have an architectural historian, uh, Jason Wood, or Jacob Woodcock. And we have an archaeologist who <coughs> trained Jane, uh, Jenny Becker, who does really good work. And, but yet our real purpose, though, there is project management, where I'm managing archaeologists that are hired from the state archaeologist's office, or smaller firms like Wasi Valley, or Bear Creek or Tallgrass. These are various firms that work across here. All do good work. I'm very lucky to have good consultants. And a lot of them have been brilliant work across Iowa for decades. Uh, we are aged a lot. So if you have any younger people interested in archaeology, please go forth and, and recommend that because you know I I'm looking for a nice, quiet, retired academic life at some point. So um, yeah. Any other questions? Oh thank you guys. Very much. I appreciate that.